Hi, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Safety View, Meet the Author. We're really lucky today to have Gary Wong back, um, kicking off our session, and a new author that he's bringing to us to have a great chat. Gary, take it away. Morning, everybody. It's um, 8 o'clock here in Vancouver, BC, and I know it's um, diff you're in different time zones. Some of you are having lunch, maybe some are having um, dinner. I'm not sure, but um, thank you for joining us. Today we have um, with us uh, Rob Creighton. Rob's um, written a very interesting book called Safety from Within. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time. We want time to talk with Rob and let um, you guys ask questions with Rob. So I'm gonna get right into it and ask Rob, why the title Safety from Within? How did that come about? Well, uh, uh, thanks Gary. Um... The, uh, the, the title actually actually came from um, the, the fact that I noticed that uh, safety was was basically put upon people. It's uh, you follow the rules, you behave, you follow the procedure and and then uh, things will be okay. And I realized that that uh, uh, it doesn't work like that. And safety from within actually means that it's safety uh, born from intrinsic motivation it works an awful lot better, an awful lot better. And people will then uh, be far more committed, far more engaged, uh, feel more autonomous to, uh, to carry out their job. And, and that's, where, that, that's why I, I found it so important. And that, 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 that's, that's why I gave it a title. Cool. Great. Okay. One of the chapters that really um, struck me is where you make an interesting distinction between the one running the risk and the risk taker who does not experience a threat. You talked a bit about the safety supply chain, where, and some of us talk about that as a safety sphere, where you've actually got it to sharpen all the frontline workers who actually are seeing the risk. And at the other end is the blunt end, where you've got the, the regulators and the government, and in this case here, the safety engineers that are kind of like in, involved in designing the system here. So what you did for me in that chapter was bring up the chasm I'm seeing between system safety engineering and safety by design, and those in operations doing a workplace safety. And it's fascinating how I think the two worlds have evolved on their own. So, I like to throw this out here, not only to you, but for other people here, but mm -hmm. I noticed that these, we've got two groups here and they're going through different associations, training, regulations, communities of practice here. And I noticed that some companies, they coexist as separate entities and maybe they even report to the same VP. So I'm curious in your thoughts on how do we bridge and bring these two people, two groups together? Um, before, uh, I'm sorry, Rob, I have to go back to your title uh, because it took a while for that to sink in, okay? I mean, that is really, really significant what you are talking about in terms of, um, you know, why things aren't working uh, because we're externalizing safety as opposed to realizing that it, it, it's a lot about how we each process the information, right? Um, so when you, uh, when you, um, Talk about that. Exactly what does that process look like? Because I think it might be related to Gary's question in terms of why we keep veering off into different things, process safety versus occupational safety, et cetera. So how were you thinking about uh, the inner self in, in terms of safety? Well, the, um, the important point here is, is that you want to you want to make people wanting things rather than than they have to do things. That's that that that's that's the, that's the crucial difference. That's the crucial difference, and uh, it, it's so obvious if you have the the engagement of uh, of people and their commitments and their own input that that things work more smooth. Uh, you, you get you get uh, an, 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 a level of working that is that is 
uh, far more in depth. Is 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 um, it, it it just works better because if you tell people what to do, the the, the motivation is is as short as as maybe how long the job is taking. Um, and and that's what we have to trigger. Yeah, it's we have to trigger that that the people are in charge. They they have they have autonomy. That doesn't mean that we do not facilitate and we do not advise. And we do not point out the risks they're exposed to, uh, but don't tell them what to do. Yeah, it's, listen. Do you see the risks, uh, the hazards that are that that we actually see around us, uh, and 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 what are we going to do about it? And make sure that that it's it's to the to to the people that are actually carrying out the job. Yeah, we 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 trust them in their sort of professionalism. Uh, they're, they're we hire them because they're professionals, and we leave all the uh, uh, all the responsibility to them uh, to carry out the job professionally. And then, when it comes to safety, there is somebody else going to tell them how to do it. That doesn't stick. Uh, it just doesn't what, work. Yeah, I'm wondering if it's cultural. We have Karsten here. Thank you, Karsten, for coming. And you can rely on him uh, as uh, you can speak to him in in your uh, in Danish, right? Is that uh, your native tongue? <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, yeah, not Danish, Dutch, but, yeah, but, but it, uh... <laughs> Rosa, I just wanted to pipe in there for also a moment, and um, it, it really touched me when I saw this in your writing, Rob, because if you recall, Rosa and Lisa and other people often. Um, I bring up the, the, the concept that we have adults at work mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and we talk about competency and expecting people to be competent. And, and the only way to do that is um, having set expectations that people are going to be their adult self in when they come to work too, that we're not trying to revert them back to a mindset of of being a, like a childlike that somebody else dominates over and, and tries to tell them what to do. So I really appreciated Rob seeing that in your writing. So thank you for getting that message out. Yes. So is it cultural? Karsten, Rob, is this because Rob, I have- to... Rosa, Rob is trying yeah. to speak, but he's muted. Oh. Yeah, it is indeed, it is, it, it is cultural. It's mm -hmm. definitely cultural because, um, in an organization, if we, uh, and, and it's a leadership thing, it's, it's, you have to, 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 to release that, that, uh, uh, that type of motivation. Yeah. Rather than as a leadership telling people is, is basically the other way around is asking them. It's, it's much more asking them than telling and instructing. Yeah. So it is indeed a cultural thing. And that is, uh, uh, you, you, you sense that if you go into a company and, and you, you see if it's an instructive type of company, that it's, it's very uh, hierarchical, uh, with, with a big hi hierarchy, that people are being told how to, uh, how to do things, or are they engaged and are they responsible for their own safety and the people around them and the teams they're working in? And, and the task at hand. So yes, absolutely. So, so is it possible that a company could actually have more than one culture? So for example, you're from the kind of in the operational field, Rob. So there's an operational culture, but could also the safety, safety engineers in that company have their own culture as well? And that's the point I was trying to make there. Is it just me or anybody else seeing that we've got a bit of a chasm between these two cultures here? How do we bring them together? Well, that, that, is, that is, again, it's a leadership thing uh, where you, um, a, a questioning thing, uh, that, that's one, uh, make sure that, that people uh, do not have to be afraid to speak up. Uh, so uh, that, that, that is a big thing, eh? that, that people do not speak up because 
they hear too many instructions around them and they might see things, but they say, well, maybe I, I rather not uh, say what I think here because, or people might think uh, different about me or being afraid to, to do something stupid. Uh, and you, you have to bridge that culture also between the safety engineer and, and operations and maintenance or whatnot, quality, whatever you talk about. It's not, it's not just these two. Uh, but to uh, to make sure that 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 uh, people are feel feel free feel free to to speak to speak up and and uh, uh, just express their their concerns and, and highlight things that they see and others may not see and um, if if it's a safety engineer uh, coming out and telling uh what sort of procedures they have to follow and what sort of ppe they have to wear or or correcting uh stuff in in a way that is that is very instructive um people don't feel good about that i'd like to I mean? uh yeah i'd like to build on this also rob um and bring into the conversation group dynamics um, I have a social work background, and so through all my studies in social work, um, we're very trained on observing group dynamics, understanding the different players in a group, in a team, and there are specifically different roles that build out. So there is an informal leader who can take over and direct the group as opposed to the formal leader. I'm not gonna get into, we can maybe do a session on that if people are interested about group dynamics, but I think it's really important that the health and safety professional and managers, et cetera, in business start to do some research on these type of already discussed dynamics in other fields. So. I want to open that up for other people to kind of chime in and, and, and talk about also and thoughts. Well, it's a, if, if I may start first, it's one of the things I, I pointed out that, that one of the, the skills uh, a safety advisor or a safety engineer must have is, is to have very good communication and social skills. The messages usually they have to bring are, are, are very often not very popular yeah and uh it, it's uh, uh to bring that to, yeah to bring that across you have to understand uh, behavior uh, and social uh um, uh science yeah it's it's how people work how people think how people uh, uh interact and and what i what i see uh what i've seen a lot is that um people know the the they have been educated in 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 safety uh, uh stuff but they 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 act as a policeman in the field, yeah, and and usually not uh, very good, in a sense that you 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 engage people and you 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 you're looking for commitment. They they're telling you uh, what you're not allowed to do, yeah, and and how to behave, and and a good safety professional is the one that is able to to interact in a way that uh, it starts to make sense to the other person to the other people and and you get a conversation where at the end you have highlighted risk that people are now convinced and committed to to do things differently or to take that risk into consideration so where where does an engineer go to learn social skills well it has to be included in the in, in the studies they do it, it's very technical. It, it, it's very black and white. Yeah, what they learn, uh, and and uh, I, I think it has to. It has to. It's also something I have I've recommended in my book that that it gets it gets introduced in these studies. Yeah, it's it's uh, uh, safety science is, is is about managing risks, um, but but you have to do it also. It it's it's work with humans. Yeah. It, it, it's not black and white, it's not binaire, it, it's, it's not digital, it's working with people. And if you work with people, you have to understand how, how the brain works and how people interact and how people work together. And, and I think uh, it, it, it's a lacking sort of uh, practice that 
people learn today in 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 these safety educations also we have over here absolutely yeah i often thought it might be a personality difference uh, uh, because some people are attracted to that and others are not um, but, you know, almost everybody I've met in the safety profession uh, tends to be a people-oriented person. So I don't understand the disconnect between why uh, safety professionals, I mean, everybody here is skilled in social skills. So obviously we're, uh, you know, talking to like-minded people, but why, why do safety professionals not seek that out for themselves? Well, that, that is, that is, a, sorry, go ahead. In, in all fairness, as a trained social worker professional, it's, it's not something that I even thought about before I got the training. So. I wonder what, what about anyone else? Hmm. So, so let me give you my experience as, as an engineer. So back in the early 70s, mm -hmm. I thought about taking anything about social sciences and eh, wasn't even on the wasn't even on the radar. Why? Because all the professors says, you must learn the technical side of things here. You will become an engineer and you will work on the ordered system technical side. What's refreshing is that when I look at today's agenda and what first year engineers are being taught, they're actually more involved in projects now. So they don't get a course on social skills 101. They actually says, you're, you're in a project here. What do you need in order to do a project here? So you kind of organically learn that, oh, I need to learn how to communicate, how to do project management, all that sort of stuff here. What's really good, I like, is that it starts in first year. If anything, I didn't get into fourth year. So the guy really starts. So it's a slow process, Rosa, but I think we're coming around realizing it's a social technical system that we work with. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you, Gary. I, I think that is our biggest um, contribution to the the bifurcation if you will of social and technical is the reinforcement that it, it if it only exists and it only matters if it's measurable and observable and anything that has been um, under the iceberg as we like to refer to it has been seen as less valuable and less valid because it isn't seen or again observed yet it all manifests into the observable. And I think with the improvements in technology and our ability to tap into the power of the unseen and its impact, um, I think we're finally coming around to recognize that what these soft skills or critical interpersonal skills do for performance is huge and measurable. I like to find out from all the listeners, has anybody been involved with safety engineers at all? Um, do you find them quite different? Do you take them to lunch at all? <laughs> you, did you take them to lunch? Is that what you asked, Gary? Yeah, what? I like to mean, I'll put, this, put this way. I think most of us here are probably in the operations side. So I'm just throwing this out here. What, what do we do about that? As opposed to them, what do we do about inviting safety engineers to socialize, to communicate, and kind of like start blending the cultures together. What can we do? Does Gordon have an idea? I just saw you turn on your camera, Gordon. Andy, how about you, Andy? Yeah, um, I actually, when uh, I, I worked with my previous company and I was based in the Netherlands, actually, I had the uh, safety and design department reporting into me as the, as the head of safety. Um, and we, uh, there's, a, there's a couple of points. I think one, we, we did a, a little competition. So we had a bit of fun and we put up some process equipment and we asked the, the safety and design engineers to see if they could spot a safety issue in the, in the picture. Um, and if they did, um, what is it that they would do about that? About 80% of them spotted the, the problem, you know, the valve in the wrong place, the inaccessible bits and pieces, the, you know, the, the classic going to bump your head off that if you try and maintain it kind of issues. Uh, only about 15% actually came up with a engineering solution for that. And I think some of that's because um, 
they tend, and I think we're talking about this, they tend to sit in their own environment inside of the office and do things in abstract almost. Um, when I started in engineering, I had to go around all the different departments. I was in the drafts department. I had to walk on the shop floor. I had to interact with the people that I, had, you know, that I had to work alongside. And you, you, you picked up because you listened to somebody else to find out what it is that they need. Um, and I think, I think more recently, engineers come out of a, a product of an engineering degree in university, and you don't perhaps get the same level of interaction as you would if you were in a workplace and sponsored and coming in and out. You know, I, I think the way that we train people has, has changed. I think there's less interaction in the education process. <clears throat> By the way, the competition that we ran changed the way that we interacted with that department because it was quite clear that you had to get out more. <laughs> I like that, really good example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah if, uh, if I can give an example. I, I wasn't being rude with my camera off earlier. In fact, uh, I was having to run around a bit, plus eat my dinner, and you didn't want to watch that on camera. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, from the conversation that I've been listening into, it, it, it's evident with social technical systems, that quite rightly, as, as many people have mentioned, the, the fact that soft skills get left behind in the chase uh, for the degree, the next qualification, uh, whether you're a safety engineer, safety operations, whatever, everyone's chasing a promotion and getting qualified and getting uh, certificates. But uh, I always like to think that it's not so much what you are, but who you are. And to get things done right and safe on time, efficiently, because there's a bean counter always in the equation. Uh, so things need to be done safely, uh, but correctly and in a good time, much the same as the whole raft of project management skills is that if you're unable to verbalize what it is that you wish to do, and like in Andy's uh, description there, uh, some engineers uh, are sort of looking 2D and that, yeah, they can find all these spots, they can find what's wrong, they can find uh, these things that need changing. But being able to verbalize that, put it into action, uh, or actually be able to describe to somebody else what that is or what a solution is. For some people, those skills as I've mentioned before, I come from a military uh, background, which is very, in some respects, rigid hierarchical and can be conceived as being autocratic. But I think I received some of the best training of, of my life during uh, those years, because in a rigid giving orders type format, you're taught to be uh, succinct what you're relaying has to be understood by a variety of skill sets you have to say in a short time it has to be said clearly and, and some of those uh, regimens are, are not seen as modern and they're not very much in the workplace at all but the growth that you get from that makes you understand that if somebody's communicated something to you that comes from above and then you have to communicate that if you like in the hierarchy down below you still have to relay that same message but you have to have a, a nuance or the context of those people how to relay that communication and how i've built around that over years since it is is in some ways being able to walk in other people's shoes having uh, the, the the psychological background where you can you can think how is how is somebody else going to think or receive this message and in their context how that goes about so it's very important the communication skills and it can be taught and there are seminars workshops and 101 other things you can do i think a lot of it comes with maturity or how you're actually operating in your environment and of course some people stay within the same work environment for a great many years and pick up bad habits or, or don't progress in those skills whereas consulting or contracting or those that move between jobs which is more of a, a modern thing now uh, to move between jobs that you then uh, learn quicker by your mistakes uh, pick up on points the good points that people have had uh, and run with those and uh, amalgamate those as to how you communicate uh, safety issues or coaching issues or getting the job done safely Question. If I may, I'm going to lose it if I don't interrupt, and I'm sorry, but what you're making me realize, or at least came to mind, is the engineers are, by personality and interest, kind of drawn to the linear, 
oh, that's Gordon, forgive me, uh, but they're drawn to the linear. And what we're talking about and what you're describing is this ability to be more adaptive and nonlinear in processing and thinking and interacting. And those that are really effective at social interactions are more connected maybe to that emotional, kind of uh, quickly moving, diverse, always changing environment where it doesn't come so easily for engineers. So they really have to put in effort of course, I'm making a gross generalization, yet the engineers I've worked with, the LANL and the scientists, have had a great deal of difficulty responding in this more adaptive way. They're kind of reinforced to be procedural. Other thoughts on that? I noticed Karsten was, uh, had a comment on that. Karsten? Sorry, I, I was distracted by something else uh, right now. But, but I wanted to chip in on the, on the uh, well, I, I'm an engineer also, uh, although I've forgotten most of it. And um, <clears throat> I, I do recall my training uh, also in, uh, in safety. Uh, it was very much, uh, you, you learn methods and some theory and a lot of regulation. And uh, well, that's it. And then uh, we were, uh, uh, well, so happy to um, both have a practical uh, bit. And I had a very good teacher in writing reports, which, which helped me developing the, the communication part. But all of the soft stuff uh, one would learn on the job. And one thing I've been uh, thinking about for a long time uh, which I think would be a nice idea to have uh, was to just introduce something like an old-fashioned apprenticeship that people well would start as a junior and then well be guided by experienced people and well left out on their own for a while and moved a bit around and then became a master at some point. I think that would be a really healthy way of well growing up uh, professionals and not uh, having them, uh, well, you have a lot of A's on your diploma, uh, here you get a project and then on to the next project and on to the next project and on into management. You and so I just, are just, just a wild idea. No, that's right. The adaptability piece. Yeah. I just wanted to chip in, ch chirp in here and share that we are getting some engagement on LinkedIn also. So uh, George wants to, to share that it starts with building positive relationships and buy in with people at the ground level, which uh, George was something that we also brought up at the beginning of it. So it's great to hear you bring that up again. Yeah, so um, our author, uh, Rob, what, so, so you've been thinking about this a lot. What, what, are, what are your thoughts? Uh, or maybe Gary has a better question to ask in that arena, but I'm just curious as to the whole issue of how we close this gap, this divide uh, between well, in, communication styles. In, indeed, what uh, what Karsten was saying, and I, I've experienced the same thing because I'm, I'm by, by uh, education, I'm a chemical engineer and communication stuff uh, starts to develop uh, once you're on the job because there are things at stake and, and we need to get things done. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, at school, uh, these, these, um, these skills, you, you don't learn. You, you learn them indeed on the job. But maybe what's, what's important towards these safety engineers is that is this, is this a stronger aspect with with uh, safety engineers than other type of of, of uh, uh, leaders or or, or 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 managers, I think one of the things there also is the difficulty that um, uh, the safety guys are are often uh, faced with compliance issues, uh, and they 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 wanted to they want to avoid fines and, and stoppages and and stuff. So it becomes often very fierce and rigid. And they and they then become become very demanding rather than 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 uh, 
uh, coming up with with building up relationship and good communication skills. So it's it's like like sometimes maybe maybe military type sort of communication, and and you know that 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 if you get if you want people's engagement, uh, you want to be respectful. Um, you want to appreciate what these people are trying to achieve, uh, what what they do. You want them on, you want them committed, rather than than in 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 a fighting uh, uh, position. Yeah, they said, well, we're going to teach him a lesson because this is not going to. We're going to show him that this is not going to work. You know what I mean? So um, uh, it, it's not cooperating it's more showing that 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 what the safety engineer is requesting that the guys on the workshop on, on, on the shop floor are not, are not able to do it and we're going to show you why so it, then you get two camps and and uh, there is there is an awful lot of of, of uh, social and, and communication skills required uh to to bridge that absolutely you also i think are bringing up the uh question of power and losing face because being an expert gives you a lot of power right and a place to to come from and yeah. so when you start switching over to building relationships and asking questions rather than telling aren't you giving up your power in a way no it's the other way around it's the other way around uh, you, you get uh, you get people on your side, and they start to think with you rather than trying to battle. So that's that's the, that's the big difference. Uh, you feel immediately if, if you are in a, in a in a situation that that you realize that something is not feeling right in the field. That there are that that, that the, the the mentality or the the state of mind of the people doing the job is not right. You, you can sense that, yeah, if you're out there and. And there's one way to say, listen, guys, make sure you got the rules, make sure you got the PPEs, get on with the job. Or, yeah, you take them aside and say, listen, guys, what's going on? Because I sense there is something not right here. Yeah, uh, you are, you, you are, are you guys, are you stressed? Are you on a time pressure? Or do you don't have the tools? Or, or who's who's after uh, going? Who's after you? To, to, to press this job that you don't feel comfortable in doing it the right way. You, you sense that immediately with, with a mechanic or an operator or, or somebody on a, on a, on a line. Uh, and that's the sense that that, that is needed and to, to, to bridge that and to get over and so, say, well, we, we have this and this problem and we just heard that if we're late, that we're going to be stopped or we're going to let a customer down or uh, we have an inspection this afternoon and we have to be ready before 12 o'clock. Uh, Listen, but is, is that is it worth the sacrifice uh, uh, risk? Because if you are stressed and you start to be in a hurry, you start to lose sight of of, of things that are happening around you. Yeah. So, and, and and that sort of Carsten communication is raising his really hand. Critical. So, um, Karsten? Yeah, I, I yeah. wanted to chip in uh, because I I agree with Rob, uh, obviously. Uh, but the interesting thing or a thought I uh, got was, uh, again, back to training, uh, we aren't really trained to ask questions. At least I wasn't there uh, 25 years ago. Uh, you're trained to, to provide answers because a manager wants, has a problem and he wants it solved. He wants an answer. He doesn't want questions and he definitely doesn't want, uh, well, it depends uh, as an answer. So uh, the training doesn't, uh, doesn't provide it uh, for you. And then uh, uh, your customer uh, doesn't really want it either. Often uh, there are some managers like you, Rob, uh, who, who are gl glad in uh, questions and, and the right questions, but I don't think they're, uh, well, they're probably not in the majority. And, yeah. and you have to, to train them to, well, I need to ask you questions to give you uh, to help you find the answer because I don't have the answer. Mostly, uh, I only can help you to discover it by yourself mm. because I can ask those stupid questions uh, about risks and are you sure and how do you know and what does the data really tell you and all that uh, well uncomfortable stuff. 
<laughs> you got that. Yeah, they want answers. They do not want questions. Andy? And Rob, okay, oh, go ahead, Rob. Go ahead, Andy. Andy. I, I just, I was going to say, I, I, I think sometimes we underestimate the power of problem solving and building relationships. Um, and, you know, going back, Rob was saying earlier about the, the role of safety people being policemen or whatever. Um, it's not perhaps seen as a helpful role, but like Karsten saying, asking questions like, what help do you need? Um, shows that you're actually helpful with somebody in achieving their goals, whereas the checklist approach is you helping yourself with corporate goals. So um, one of the observations I've made in my time is that instead of trying to fulfill a corporate role, if you go up to a team and, and actively help them achieve their goals, not give them another problem because they've already got problems, then you build a relationship with that team. Um, and find out what's going on. And then if you go fight battles for them to de-block some of the issues that they actually have in getting what they need to get done done, then you build even more of a relationship which builds trust, which gets you more information, which builds the teamwork, which builds the relationships, which just gets stuff done. Um, and in that sort of environment, you know, you, it's the team that fixes the issues and, and moves on. Yeah, I'd, uh, if, I, if I may build on the last comment of Andy and, and Carsten, uh, some of you may recall, I mentioned last time I'm in a maritime background, I'm currently on a ship. We've got 131 guys on here. There's over 15 different nationalities. And we're in heavy construction for the critical uh, infrastructure, uh, energy offshore. And I have to, as the leader on air, ensure that the guys and the girls uh, are focused on their task. Uh, as much as they can be to rely on their training uh, and the supervisors are out there with them. But I was feeling on here that due to crew change, COVID, the quarantine, we've got to do and that, that it, it was sort of, there was a build up and not much was being said. And some of it is welfare based like TV or Wi-Fi reception. Some of the simple things that most companies would take for granted, but in a maritime environment, it means everything to be able to call your, your loved ones uh, each day. And if you can't do that for about two days, it has a, a big impact on the psychology of, of the guys that are out there doing these critical uh, safety tasks. So I took a leap out of the humble leadership uh, book and uh, addressed the whole ship's company in, in, in two watches. Uh, uh, obviously, we, we work 24 hours, so there was two watch systems. So I did it twice in one day and basically uh, said to them, uh, I'm not going to explain psychological safety or what this is all about, but I'm going to tell you, you've got a voice. It will be listened to. It will be listened actively. And uh, what I did was a bit of sharing and from a decade ago, gave them uh, some experience from my past uh, of being isolated and uh, serious injuries on a project. And I said, some of these uh, uh, things come about because people are fearful or they don't want to talk. I, I have no uh, problem with, with the understanding that nobody on here is fearful but with the different cultures and not wishing to lose face to Africans or Asians, especially and most, most Europeans will speak up for themselves as lower deck lawyers and tell you exactly how it is and what they want fixed. But uh, some of the uh, Asians that we work with and Africans do not want to lose face uh, and see, seem less macho or whatever in a male dominant environment. So uh, I gave them that space and said, to, you know, talk to your supervisors. If you don't want to talk to them, at least talk to your buddy, etc." Get, get your point across, tell us what it's really like. And I know in my position, they're not gonna come beating down my door and come to my office and tell me how it is. As much as I tell them that my door's always open, please come and talk to me. But I slowly, as the crew changes go on or over the weeks and then months, get to meet all the guys and uh, they get to understand me. I think some of that humble leadership plays a big part in, in, in the soft skills that you use during that. And I was quite surprised. I think there was about 24, 25 people came up to me directly over the following 24 hours and said simple things like, thanks for caring. Hey, somebody actually gives a damn. And uh, yeah, you know, some of the guys are actually opening up now and uh, talking about a couple of things. And most of those things can be rectified, you know, by other management or whatever, uh, logistics or better Wi-Fi or whatever it might be. But if they don't have a voice, then they suffer in silence. So, and I'm an engineer. Uh, so we're... Some engineers have uh, soft skills as well. <laughs> but yeah, it's okay. really, really work well. It'd be great to hear, Rob, what are your reflections and thoughts on what you're hearing from the group? 
Well, what I what I just uh, just heard from uh, from 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 Gordon and, and Andy is that they have uh, definitely uh, experienced uh, along their way that uh, um, making that that communication and and, and questioning and and uh, and listening and and uh, encourage people to 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 speak up uh, and and it will be uh, it will be heard and we will do uh, we will take your your points into consideration even even if the message it's it, it's a weak one yeah that it might not be overly critical but just being heard and just being part of the team and already makes the difference. Yeah, people don't want to be told uh, do such and such and you'll be all right. It's people want to want to uh, um, join and and be heard and 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 then they they it is that 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 intrinsic motivation development comes from there as well. Yeah. Uh, so so yeah, but the skills you just you you both just expressed. Is, is 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 our skills that that, that are definitely missing and, are, and highly crucial to to get engagement and and involvement and commitment because that's that's not what 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 you very often see on the shop floor it usually is is uh, we have to get this done by then and then and and uh, this is the, the process parameters i want to see and if i come back please show me we we're there yeah okay that's not very motivational so, so Rob has actually a lot of useful do's and don'ts, advice to operational leaders. I'm gonna give you one and maybe get Rob to explain this. His says, pay attention to and take measures for situations that are in the center silo of the Heinrich pyramid and ignore the trivial issues. So what does that mean, Rob? Well, what it actually means is that that certainly as leaders and managers, we have to pay attention to the stuff that, that, that kills you. Yeah, and the stuff that really brings bad injuries. And, and what, 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 what has happened over the years that uh, we, we start to, to stumble over, over trivial issues, trivial issues where uh, people themselves are able to take care of. It, it's, it's a bit like, like treat, them, treat people like children. Yeah, the, the, the trivial stuff, people, uh, they, they look after themselves. Nobody wants to get hurt. But what what we want as as uh, uh, as a company is that people don't get killed, and people don't get get uh, badly injured. And that's the stuff we want to look at. And what you see on the other sides of the triangle is, is that uh, we're looking at, at 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 issues that that are uh, it may it may cause a little. Uh, uh, a little issue, but it, it, it's not so critical. And, 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 and that's what I mean with that. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. Well, what do others think? I, actually, this is really interesting, Rob. Uh, I don't know if you know of Tony Mushara. Um, he wrote Risk-Based Thinking a while ago, and he's releasing a new book on critical steps with Rob Ferris and Jim Marinas. And it speaks to identifying what are those critical steps that must go right. And then allowing kind of the adaptive needs to take care of the noise, focused on the what must go right. I'm kind of seeing a parallel between what you're describing. Not sure if it's accurate, but it uh, triggered it in my head. You have this acronym STKY, stuff that kills you. I've heard that some other places around here. Has anybody else come across that acronym as well? Stuff that kills you, scary. Uh, you so call it sticky safety. Oh, sorry. Sticky safety, yeah. Carsten? Yeah, I was saying there is a couple of uh, podcasts with uh, Todd Conklin uh, around it, but <clears throat> haven't found the time to listen to him yet. <laughs> so the, can, uh, can, oh, uh, go ahead, Um I was going to say the stuff that kills you, um, but we 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 seldom realize how it's the small things that add up that 
end up killing people, you know? Like we think it's going to be a big deal, but for example, you know, not listening to the information that people mm. are trying to give you because th they don't have credibility or you don't trust them, right? Or they don't have the right position. So you don't listen. And, and so uh, we could say that stuff that kills you includes not listening. I've never seen that on a list. Mm. What are the other intangibles that aren't on the list of stuff that kills you? That might be the biggest one, not listening. Dignity, respect. Dignity. Giving dignity and respect, yeah. Mm -hmm. Inclusion, diversity missing. Ooh. The integrity. integrity. What was that, Gordon? Oh. Integrity, the integrity, doing the right thing. Uh, I've got a bad uh, connection here offshore, so there's a two second delay minimum. Okay, thank you for being on in spite of that. Yeah. Yeah, so it's, is it um, really the physical that ultimately kills us? Or is it the way that we relate to each other, socialize? That's such a big question, Rosa. Maybe it's related to context. You know, if we're truly dealing with just a technical object and it's procedural and following those steps is absolutely critical to living, then maybe it's just cut and dry. Uh, I, the human comes in, of course, when things go wrong. Uh, but to your point, yeah, I think um, it is those nuanced things that break relationships down and stop the sharing that put us at risk. So I just wanted to put out there that sometimes just following procedure keeps us alive. Yeah. I think one of the things we're discovering in our work in looking at the impact of COVID-19 is the increased amount of stress of mental health issues that are leading to actually youth committing suicide. So that's not physical, other than the fact that it's self-physical. But what are those pressures that these young people are feeling to kind of say, they're, you know, they're over the tipping point, I'm going to commit suicide. And it's a growing trend. And it's um, what I think we need to really address as part of the new normal as we come out of this thing. Because you know, it's going to be around until what, another full year, even though the vaccine is being produced. It's going to take a while for distribution and can get it out there. And the young people are probably at the end of the list of getting the vaccine. It's Very not just young people, it's, it's a lot of, um, you know, uh, it's an epidemic really, particularly in the high stress industries. Yeah, it is hitting so many. The young are very vulnerable for all the reasons Gary just pointed out. And just today, uh, there was data shared that 20% uh, fewer people are going into college, uh, adolescents, young adults are going into college this coming year. Those kids are at risk. It puts society at risk. Is and that global or, or US? Global. Mm. Mm. Wow. It seems that, that uh, what Lisa said provides a good example of the fact that what we're trying to address is requires a systemic approach as opposed to an individual. If you, for example, the kids going into college, think about one college counselor trying to solve that problem. They're, they have a piece of the solution, but they don't have the whole solution. And if you apply that then to uh, industry in the safety arena, safety professionals have access to a piece of the solution but they're often being uh, leveraged or, or um, held accountable for providing the entire solution where the entire solution comes from the uh, culture that the organization has created through the um, uh, actions of, of upper management. And it, there's, a, there's a systemic piece, there's an individual piece, there's a, a group piece, the group dynamics of of different groups coming together that I think we're trying to pressure safety professionals in solving those larger problems. 
and it's not possible to, to uh, for them to do that because they don't have control over the entire system. Mm -hmm. I, so I think it puts a whole different twist on your title, Rob, safety from within. How do you as an individual know that you're nearing a tipping point as well? So you know, what are your weak signals, your early detection that, hey, I need help and it's okay to call out and ask for help. And then look at your circle of friends and colleagues here. Are they noticing things you know, that I've got a bad feeling about Bob and sharing those stories to others so we can kind of catch those before something bad happens. Well, it's the indications, the indication of, of tension and stress. Uh, people, you, you, you sense people not responding, uh, not responding as you would expect in a, in a sort of, of a, in a good interactive uh, way of communication. That's that's probably an, an already indicators that things are wrong, uh, mm -hmm. and it does it does require attention. Yeah. It, it reminds me of what you have in your book called Flip Thinking Quotes. And one quote yeah. that really hit a sweet spot for me was, when you know you should open your mouth, keeping quiet is a form of lying. I found that very yeah. profound. Yeah, the, indeed, it is, a, it is a full, as we, we talk about uh, psychological safety, uh, we, we encourage people to, 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 yeah, to speak up, but it's not something in a sense that is, is, it's respectful or it's nice to you or, or I like you and I like you to talk and I like to ask you questions. No, it's the other way around. If you see things that are actually a risk or a danger and you don't say something, yeah, that, that is a big problem. Mm -hmm. it, it's not a, 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 a small issue. It becomes a big problem because you put maybe other colleagues or whatever in danger because you, you're not saying what you should say. Yeah? And, and, and the, the, that's the, maybe the, 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 the flip side of, of psychological safety. We say, oh, psychological safety, yeah? we want to have uh, 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 being questioned and uh, feel free to speak. Uh, no, you have to speak. You, you are part of this, this team, part of this company, part of this organization. And, you are a professional and we expect you to, to know the things. And if you notice these things and you don't say something, we, I have a problem with you. I, I think Rob, um, what comes to my mind is unfortunately, historically, um, the repetitive messaging to the workforce is you're not paid to think, do what I say, just do your job. Um, as a frontline worker, those are common messages that we were told by upper management and direct managers. And now we're asking people to flip the switch overnight and feel free to just say what you want, despite the fact that there's still very much a reprimanding culture that if you speak up, that means you could lose a shift several shifts. So you're, you go from 40 hours a week down to six hours a week, and you can't live on that. And so I think part of it also is looking at what is the reality that the workforce is actually working in? And how can we kind of nurture that journey? What are other people's thoughts? Yeah, I, I wanted to say that I agree with you, Rob. I mean, it is an ethical responsibility. And I consider myself a highly ethical person, but I, I was not able to speak up for many decades. Uh, just, it just wasn't possible because of all the internal fear that I had from prior discrimination and not being heard, not being listened to. So we have these, and I, of course, now that uh, I'm, I'm more mature, I realize those are all self-imposed beliefs because, um, but it doesn't matter because if you don't know it or you don't know how to release those beliefs, it, 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 the telling me to speak up is not going to make a difference. It simply is not. And so I've, I've dedicated uh, my life really to helping people um, move from the position of 
I can't speak up because my amygdala is firing on all cylinders, you know, threat, 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 to, um, you know what, if this person doesn't like me or they don't want me to work here, I'm going to be okay. But, but that's been decades. And I don't know how we're going to, uh, well, new people coming into the workplace, young people, I think are an easier, and, and they're also more outspoken anyway, different generations. Uh, but older people or people that have been in the workforce for a long time, uh, we are not talking uh, about a quick fix here or that if we make people feel guilty, they'll speak up. No, that, 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 that's why I'm into psychological safety. I see Andy keeps wanting to say something. Oh, uh, sorry, Rob. Well, just short, yeah. That is the, the message to new leadership. Leaders are able to allow people to speak up. Leaders are also in the position to shut them down. That's what the challenge is. What, you, what you've experienced is, is, is probably also that, that uh, you were in an environment that, 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 that it wasn't permitted or you felt it wasn't permitted. You felt fear. Yeah. See, I, I, think, I think it's about trust and fear and it's 100% about leadership. Um, you know, I, I hear uh, people talk about engagement and there's almost a, a part of the definition of engagement is that it's the workforce that engages. But actually I find that if it's leadership that engages that you actually get participation. I think people want to contribute positively and I think the, the premise of speaking up is if, if you see something wrong, you have to speak up, but there's, there's a negative involved in that. Now, if you ask somebody, you know, have you got an idea or can you help me see something that we can do better, then you're inviting a positive. People will normally point at something and say, I think that's not right over there but you've turned a negative into a positive and created a, a condition where people are feeling that they're contributing to the greater good that way. So, you know, things like near miss reporting, nobody's ever got that to work properly. And it's because people are, are you know, speak up and there's a negative or there's a bad or there's a, con you know, potentially embarrassment or, an, or something, you know, gone wrong there. But if we say, can you see anything that we can improve on? Well, scaffold's a little bit dodgy, isn't it? So, you know, I think it's very, very important for leadership to create, you know, a bit of vulnerability in themselves by asking for help, but that gives somebody else the opportunity to, to fill that void with a, with a positive and feel like they're positive contributing to the greater good of the organization or the team. You invite them. We're, you invite them. Yeah, we're, we're hitting the top of the hour now. It's amazing how fast these sessions go. Yeah. So I'd, I'd like to invite John, and we heard from you, John, and Tanya. We've seen you lots in the chat, but maybe you want to add a few comments with and share, the, share them with us? We also have Kai. Oh, there's Kai. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Anybody that hasn't spoken, it's your opportunity to do so. No, I just appreciate uh, listening to everybody's perspective on this. Uh, I work in a, a construction type industry, so we do see a lot of multicultural, multi-generational uh, mm -hmm. people in the field, and um, it, is, it is hard to get across to them uh, the what's in it for me. I think I, I saw somebody doing that earlier, um, because, there's, because there is so many gaps in the generations, and uh, people are transitioning in and out of these uh, work sites as well, so... Um, yes, I, I just, I'm totally on board with it, what everybody's saying on, um, you know, you have to make it a psychologically safe workplace where people can speak out and, um, yeah, just make sure people understand the big picture where they fall into it, how they contribute. And I'm, I'm always a, an advocate of, uh, safety and quality go hand in hand. So you get these learning teams together and you ask them, you know, what scares you, first of all? what is in the workplace that, that where you lose sleep at night because you're, you're scared and get them to come up with the actual ideas on, on how to make things safer. Um, so learning teams is a big thing to me, but I don't want to keep going too much because 
there is a, a time to, a time thing here. So yes, I, I appreciate everybody. And uh, Rob, I will be buying your, your book. So thank you. Let me just add in that, uh, mention the, the uh, factor of engagement. Uh, from the areas I've looked into, the engagement is a foundational element of both safety and productivity. So if, so if organizations are interested in, in earning profits and keeping the finances going, then they're going to want to engage their, their workforce in good productive activity. That's the same foundation for engaging a workforce in safe activities also. Thanks, Fred. And Kai? He's on mute and he may not be able to get on, but... Oh, okay. Hello, Kai? No? no. <laughs> well, Anybody else? Um, closing comments, questions? Thank you, Rob. Thanks. And thank you for your sincerity. Um, I can tell it's from the heart. Thank you. Thank you. This was great. Thank you. Thank you, you for so having me. Okay, Tamara, you're going to close off. You want me to close Carson off? Carson wants to say something. Oh, Carson. <laughs> no, he was going to open I, I was just waving because other people were waving. Oh, so, uh, okay. but they did, 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 did <laughs> great, se great okay. session. So, <laughs> please close it off uh, if you must. Okay. Thank you, okay. everyone. Yeah. For attending. Go ahead, Thank Gary. Close it off. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, <laughs> everyone. Yeah. For coming to another Meet the Author session. We have another one coming up next year and um, tomorrow we'll be out there um, sending out all the announcements and emails here. So please look forward to that and um, have a happy new year since we won't see you until next year. Hey, Merry um, Christmas too, but um, okay. We'll see virtual Merry Christmas as well. <laughs> Thanks, Gary. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Gary. Thanks, Gary. Gary. Good. Hi, all. Wow, that's my first. <laughs> and I just want to also share with everybody, I put the link to purchase Rob's book into the <coughs> chat. So grab that. And it's also in the LinkedIn chat on live. And it'll be also on the episode page, because uh, this is all going to be posted with the chat notes on the uh, safetypedia.com. Look under podcast and you can find it there. All right. Thanks. Thanks, all right, Thanks thank everyone. You. Okay. Bye-bye. Hey, thank Bye. you all. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.